On January 2nd, 1805, a portion of the enslaved people who lived and worked here at Chatham Manor rose up against their overseer and resisted being forced back to work during the Christmas holiday. Chatham may look like a place of Southern opulence and wealth, but for all of Chatham's antebellum history, it was a place entirely supported by the hard work of enslaved people. William Fitzhugh, the first owner of the house, had Chatham built, but the bricks themselves were laid by the enslaved people who lived and worked here. Fitzhugh, who struggled financially towards the end of his life, often sold the enslaved people that worked for him to pay off his debts. Fitzhugh also had his enslaved people whipped and flogged for behavior that he deemed inappropriate. It was in the cold of January when the insurrection began. The overseer at Chatham commanded the enslaved to go back to work after the break they were given over the Christmas holidays and the enslaved resisted. According to all accounts, it was not a planned uprising. Instead, it was a spontaneous insurrection of several men rising up and resisting being forced back into work during the 12 days of Christmas. After trying to whip a young enslaved man named Robin, the overseer was overtaken, tied down, and whipped by the resisting people. The overseer was freed by an enslaved man who helped him escape. After going to the nearby town of Falmouth, the overseer returned to Chatham with at least two men, John Bett and Benjamin Bussell, as assistants to put down the insurrection. A fight ensued, which led to Abram, another enslaved man, hitting Benjamin Bussell on the head with an axe giving him a wound that would prove mortal. Once again, the insurrection was stronger than those who were trying to put it down, and the overseer and his party left Chatham. Warrants were put out for the arrest of the enslaved people involved in the insurrection. Those involved tried to flee Chatham, and Phil, an enslaved man, was shot by those who were coming to arrest him. With his death and the arrest of others, an end was brought to the uprising at Chatham that represented years of unrest. Three enslaved men lost their lives as a result of the insurrection. Another man, James, died trying to flee from Chatham to find safety in Fredericksburg. In crossing the Rappahannock River, he broke through the ice and drowned. Abram, the man who delivered the blow that killed Benjamin Bussell, was hanged for his involvement in the insurrection. Two other enslaved men, Robin and Cupid, were sentenced to be hanged because of their role. However, because of their youth and the endorsement of a local man for their behavior, they were instead shipped further south to plantations. Because of the harsher conditions of deep south plantations, it can be assumed that their lives were cut short by the transportation. As these men were all viewed as property in the eyes of Virginia, William Fitzhugh was reimbursed by the government for Abram, Robin, and Cupid at a combined value of $1,400. Fitzhugh would take out an ad in the paper announcing that he would be selling many of those people who had worked here at Chatham. The sale would take place two years to the day of the insurrection that took place here. While the insurrection at Chatham was one day of the plantation's history, it represents something larger resistance. It happened here at Chatham in the most obvious form on January 2nd of 1805, but it also occurred in minor ways in everyday life caused by the enslaved people resisting their conditions. This happened at Chatham through enslaved people slowing down work in the field and breaking equipment. Notably, one case of nonviolent resistance here occurred in 1797 when an enslaved man named Phil destroyed Fitzhugh's garden, leaving him without a single plant in the plot. Whether this Phil who destroyed William Fitzhugh's garden was the same Phil who was the first man to die in the 1805 insurrection is lost to history, like much of the history of the enslaved people who lived and worked here at Chatham. However, their stories of resistance still live on.